lifted in Scotland to on the Scottish establishment, well, my goodness me, how that would lift the lid on so many other uh, things that connect into it. Mm -hmm. It's no accident that we have the biggest secret society in the world in terms of numbers is the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Um, and uh, so what Robert Green and those campaigning in relation to the Holly Gregg case were dealing with was, um, if you like to use another metaphor, it was a big, big domino and is and if that one falls, well, a lot of others go with it. And so there has been clearly massive manipulation, mendacity, and, uh, and, and a downright fraud in the end um, to make sure that the uh, real truth about uh, Holly Gregg, what happened to her, who was involved, and why there has not been, and, and Robert's court case really brought this out in the evidence, mm -hmm. why there has not been anything approaching a proper investigation into her allegations. And of course, what they, uh, they, they uh, had to do was uh, make sure that uh, when he appeared in court, that the witnesses he wanted to have his uh, counsel uh, question in relation to all this, including the lack of investigation, like uh, Elish Angelini, Angelini, the um, uh, former uh, head law officer, basically the Lord Advocate uh, in Scotland, uh, why she, both as Lord Advocate and when she was um, chief law officer in the area where it happened in around Aberdeen, or is alleged to have happened, why in neither case was uh, an investigation carried out and, 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 and played through. And, but he couldn't question her because the judge would not allow her to appear as a, a witness. And there was not a jury, there was just a judge making this decision. So uh, when you look at it, it's a head shaker. Yeah. And it was obvious that they were going to do what they could to, um, to make life as difficult as possible for Robert Greene. But, you know, I've met a lot of people in my life and, um, when it comes to tenacity, when it comes to decency, when it comes to um, seeking what is right, uh, no matter what the consequences for yourself, well, Robert Greene is right up there because there's nothing in this for him. There is n nothing except hassle. There's nothing except stress. There's nothing except um, uh, pressure from the establishment over many years now. And yet he's still there and he's still going and he's in prison at the moment and he's still um, working to, to get this, uh, this, this story uh, circulating to, um, to, to the public and to continue to put pressure on the uh, authorities to do what they uh, desperately do not want to do, which is thoroughly investigate this case. And why don't they want to do that? Mm. Because they're terrified of where it might lead. Yeah, and uh, it connects with so many other uh probably networks as well around the world if, if we have this scenario of um, mass amounts of, of children and, and, and women and what have you being kidnapped around the world being sent to different places then this um, Scottish particular this ring will uh, undoubtedly connect with other rings as well and there's been ex you know exposés of this in the past uh, and it seems to go only so far David and then after a certain while the investigations are, are, are shut down. They, they they discover, notice that it's on an international level. It's big. It's huge. Then you don't hear anything else after that. Well, I mean, for a start, um, anything uh, that uncovers the uh, happenings of the Scottish establishment in terms of Satanism and child abuse and, and all the rest of it will immediately connect into the uh, Westminster Parliament. Immediately. I mean, they're almost indivisible. And of course... These rings um, are rings within rings. In the end, it's a global network. And uh, so if you keep pushing and uh, going down this road of uncovering uh, one ring, especially a, a fundamentally uh, important one to them, like the one in Scotland, then you, you keep walking. Well, you know, the the range of what you uncover just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and expands out and out and out. And it, it certainly uh, leaves Britain, goes into Europe, goes across to America and eventually encompasses the globe. Mm. Because one of the things that I um, came across many years ago, right back in the 90s, for various um, you know, synchronistic uh, reasons that 
came into my life um, was the scale of the number of children that go missing every year never to be seen again in america alone it's staggering yeah. see the big problem is and i understand it um is that people um equate the number of children that go missing with the number of high profile stories of children going missing um on the mainstream media like of course the madeline mccann uh, story was it was a, a a classic example of mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. but they are just uh, the tip of the iceberg doesn't even begin to uh, describe the scale of children that go missing through various uh, forms and in various ways every year. It is a stunning global um, figure which, which goes into the millions if you add them all up. I'm sure there's no question about that. Um, and uh, most of them, um, you know, are never heard of again and it's all just forgotten. I mean, in, yeah. in many countries, no one even bothers to look for them. You know, I talked to Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, and he says this is happening in Africa. This is happening in his own community in uh, in the Kalahari region, where children are, are being taken and ne never to be seen again. And you know, in these 22 years that I've been at least consciously on this journey, um, every time uh, a, a, a subject comes in, like like this one we're talking about with children, um, as I go into other subjects and other areas as as the years go on eventually all these different apparently totally unconnected uh, subjects start to come together and to understand uh, child the the scale of child abuse the scale of of, of missing children the scale of uh satanic ritual uh, killing of children uh, we need to understand uh, the, the force behind this global conspiracy that w operates from the shadows and why it wants the energy of children uh, and why um, throughout known history uh, people have talked about um, sacrificing young virgins to the gods and what we realize is that that's just code. Young virgins means children mm -hmm. and and what I've uncovered over the years is that these um, entities that go under endless different names, you know, I call them the, the, the reptilians, although there are other non-human forms involved, uh, but the reptilian one seems dominant at that level, though it goes well out beyond them, I suggest. Um, and, uh, but others call them the Chittahuri in, in Zulu, uh, in the Zulu law. They're known as the, uh, the Archons in, right. in the Gnostic writings. They're known as the Jinn in Islamic uh, uh, belief. Uh, and on and on and on it goes. And these entities feed off human energy. And because, like everything with energy, uh, the energy of di different frequencies syncs with energy of the same frequency. And thus, these entities to absorb human energy um, have to um, uh, have energy that is within the frequency range they can absorb. And it seems to me that this um, relates to low vibrational human emotion that relates to fear, to frustration, to depression, uh, to, to frustration, all these things. Um, uh, the, 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 the emotion that leads to violence is uh, in wars, conflicts, individual and collective, are all this energy that they absorb. And, um, but there's a particular energy that is like a nectar to them, and that is the energy of children before puberty. Um, as I pointed out in the books uh, over the years, um, this reality that we experience as physical through the conscious mind is actually illusory physical. It's holographic. We decode it to appear physical, but actually it's il illusory. This, this is why uh, quantum physicists uh, can't understand why uh, atoms are supposed to make up the... Um, this solid physical world, which isn't, when atoms have no solidity. But it's not a paradox. It's because they don't have to be solid. Nothing has to be solid to create a, 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 an illusory solid reality, a holographic reality. Hmm. And, and so when uh, we go back to the base construct of everything, whether it's the human body or, or, or uh, the universe, certainly as we experience it anyway, um, it's a waveform um, 
vibrational information construct. And, and what we call the physical, the holographic, is like a movie screen. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the waveform level, what I call the metaphysical universe, um, is like the projector at the back of the movie theater. It's, it's from where all this comes, and then it hits the screen, and we see the movie. But what we're doing uh, through what I call the human body computer is we are decoding that waveform information construct into holographic reality on our personal screens, which is, is the decoded by the genetic structure, the brains involved, obviously, but the DNA and the genetic structure in general are doing this. So therefore, when we see um, what they call puberty, we see a hormonal change, a chemical change. But that chemical change in holographic reality is merely a decoded expression of an energetic change going on. In the, in the child, right. an energetic change, an information change, which is moving the child from being a child into um, what we call adulthood. Um, and it's that energy before that change takes place that these entities most want to absorb, what most want to, uh, to, to, to uh, have as a, a food source, a power source. And thus, throughout history, We've had this uh, theme of, of, of children, in effect, being um, sacrificed to the gods because they, they want that energy. And so what's happening to these children, many of these children, I mean, a lot of these children that go missing never to be seen again, there will be other explanations for it. But in, in terms of um, the ratio of them, a large number of them, I suggest, a very large number, um, end up in sacrificial rituals. They end up being uh, in pedophile rings and stuff like that. Um, and, and they're having their energy vampired because there, there is the, the process, horrific as it sounds, but we need to face these things if we're going to sort them out, yep. um, where at the point of sacrifice, the energy of the child is released and the entities absorb that energy. Uh, but there's also the pedophilia aspect of this where um, these, um, these bloodlines, uh, these hybrid bloodlines, which were known in the ancient world as the demigods and, and what have you, are um, a hybrid genetic uh, creation that is part human and part uh, reptilian. And so they have this dual um, genetics. And they were created specifically to be the middle men and women within our reality, what we call visible light and the electromagnetic uh, uh, spectrum, etc., um, to represent the, the, the agenda of these hidden entities um, in human society so that we are manipulated and have our society directed by forces we do, don't know exist because it seems to be being done by people in places of leadership and influence and power that appear to be human. Well, actually, they're conduits. And this relationship can be um, kind of, or this dynamic can be described um, uh, and symbolized very much like this. You have, um, often you see scientists in a laboratory who can't work directly with some material. So the material goes in a sealed tank. They stand outside the sealed tank and they put their arms into the tank and, and, and work with the material while they're outside of it. Right. If you take the tank to be symbolic of our reality, human reality, you take the scientists to be um, these entities operating outside of that frequency range overwhelmingly, though not entirely, and the gloves that they, they, they use to go inside the tank to be these hybrid bloodlines, well, then you have the dynamic. And, though, and so these uh, bloodlines are a conduit. Uh, uh, and because of their hybrid nature, again, you take hybrid genetics, you take that to its base form, which is waveform. It's a, an energy field 
that is very much more vibrationally compatible with these reptilians than the general run of the population. And that's why these bloodlines were created, so that they could be very powerfully possessed um, by these entities and their um, mental and emotional, pro well, passes for emotional processes, uh, could be taken over. And thus, they're just the, if you like, the... Um, the middle men and women um, that allow these entities to manipulate human society while right. humans have no idea they exist. And where I'm going with this in terms of pedophilia is that this uh, genetic compatibility, I mean, it's horrible what I'm going to say, but you know, let's face it, means that when a, a pedophile is having sex um, with, especially a pedophile within this bloodline, is having sex with a child, what that um, what is happening is the overshadowing entity possessing that pedophile and stimulating that desire for sex with children is drawing off the child's energy through the conduit pedophile and absorbing the child's energy. That's why, um, uh, as I started to uncover this from the early 90s up to present day, one of the things I found again and again is if you follow some of these major names in the conspiracy uh, and, and you follow them through in terms of investigation and research, secret societies always come up, Satanism always comes up with the top people, and so does pedophilia. Mm. Those three things continually come up in relation to these major bloodline uh, uh, personalities. And these, this is the kind of reason why. And, and, and you really, when you go along this uh, journey of research, if you go along it with a preconceived idea, with a religious belief, a political belief, a scientific belief, well, forget it, because unless you're... Um, prepared to let them go in the light of the information, then you're never going to get into the rabbit hole more than a very short distance because you are going to censor where you need to go to understand this whole deal that we're going, going uh, through. So you can see there, Henrik, we've started off talking about Holly Gregg and her allegations about the paedophilia and Satanism of the Scottish establishment and, and Robert Greene and what he's doing. And already we're miles away from that, talking about entities and all the rest of it. Mm. This is how the tapestry works. And, and, and we, mu we must, if we're going to understand this um, and allow it to unfold for us, we need to be really light on our feet in terms of where we're prepared to go. Uh, and not censor things just because at first hearing they sound fantastic. Otherwise, we're just in our own box. We're in a different box to, to, to people that dismiss the conspiracy altogether, but we're still in a box. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, um, it's very you know, important to be able to connect the dots, and that's why that's one of the most dangerous uh, things of all to the establishment as it is. It's, it's like... You can hear stories, um, and they're in their disconnected manner, no problem. You can do a great job in that sense from the point of view of media of actually extracting information about what truly is going on. But when you begin to connect the dots, it's all of a sudden then, then, then their viewpoint on you is that then, then you're mad. Then you're the guy with all the newspaper clippings on the wall kind of, <laughs> kind of thing. Right. You know? yeah. and, and, but that's really where the, the key lies, though, when you actually begin to connect the dots. And, and, what you, and what you say, also doing that without actually going out to just only confirming your, your initial uh, belief, but actually letting the information lead you uh, w where it may. We, th it's so important, and that's all, all what this is about, laying the puzzle in a sense. Um, well, this is, this, is the, this is the thing, Henrik, you see. I mean, I mean, at what stupidity, in my view, and what unbelievable arrogance to think that we, in this manipulated density, can possibly know everything that we need to know or there is to know. That's yep. ridiculous. And, and, and when you bring it down to its most extreme, you know, we are living within an infinite reality of which this one that we think we're experiencing is, 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 is but a tiny sliver um, of, of all possibility. And yet when you bring it down to, it, to its most extreme, 
the people are saying that all you need to know is written by who knows who, who knows when, in who knows what circumstances, between two covers of a single book called a Bible or a Koran or whatever uh, else you know, you know, they call them. Mm. It's ridiculous. And I've reached the point some time ago now um, where I can say I don't believe anything. I don't believe anything. And I think we, we really need to get into that uh, realm of not believing anything. And what I, what, I, what I mean by that is that I have a perception at any point um, of how I see things and how I see things are. But I know that because there is the vastness of forever, that there's always, always more to know about everything. And therefore, nothing solidifies into a belief that then starts to repel all borders to protect itself um, from from being moved on. Um, and so um, I'm uh, I have a perception of how things are. And th but uh, but I've got me trainers on <laughs> and I'm light on me feet. And I'm ready to go in any direction, any moment in the light of new insight, new information, new experience. Because as Socrates in ancient Greece is supposed right. to have said, yes. even, if, even if it didn't, it was brilliant. Um, wisdom is knowing how little we know. Yep. And that keeps your mind open. So nothing solidifies into a belief. It's always a perception of how things are, which you're prepared to move any time if, if, the, if, if what comes to you is justified. Justifies That's right. It. Right. But this is also, the, now we're in the, the realm of psychology and battling with people's belief system, as you say, and, and there's also a tendency to be in this safety zone, that it's, it's, it's secure, it's uh, comfortable to, to have an idea that the authorities or the scientific field or religion, God, whatever, has things in control. Uh, we don't have to worry about how it really is. Uh, and, and so from my point of view, David, then there's something with the human psyche almost in a, in a way that, that we need to... Uh, try to try to you know awaken in a sense that it's nothing wrong with stepping outside of that box and actually you know beginning to take a leap of faith and admit that we don't know everything that's just the way it is so let's discover it let's let's re you know uh, reinvent the, this idea of actually uh, not admitting that we don't know anything and go from there but that's very difficult we're, we're up against quite a bit there aren't we yes uh, and this really um, brings us into an area that I I. I write about in in the new book, and and of course, uh, 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 when a book is finished, it doesn't mean I stop and sit around um, until the next one starts. The moment a book is finished and it's gone to the printers, uh, you know, I'm still moving. I mean, right? It, 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 I find it extraordinary, you know, when I I, I see people, researchers, like uh, years and years ago making a presentation and it's always very interesting yes very, and, and then you uh, 10 years later you see them again and they make the same presentation it's like what where, 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 where have we been you know it, it, we need to if we're going to uh, understand what's going on constantly constantly expand and expand so we, we grasp more and more of what we're part of because that's leading us closer and closer to understanding how we do something about it because you're not going to change the five cents um uh, world in the five sense world that's like standing on a movie uh, 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 in a movie theater screaming at the screen and telling it to change it ain't gonna change it's a done deal it's hit the screen we've got to get back to where this is coming from and change that that's that's how we do it so you know the Illuminati as uh, some people call them and sometimes they call themselves these this network of bloodlines and secret societies behind uh, global events, they don't have any problem uh, overwhelmingly with people trying to change this reality within this reality because they know it ain't got to change. This is what they're trying to keep from us. Um, and so we need to open our minds and, and let the information be our guide and not uh, preconceived idea because we need to go into some very strange areas and when we do, strange from the normal point of view, and when we do, suddenly we can start to make sense of what's happening. And you, you mentioned there, Henrik, about the way people are kind of locked, locked, locked off from, from going in these areas. And, and they operate in a very tiny uh, expanse of, of possibility. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and funnily enough, one of the greatest ways of keeping people under control and, and asleep and ignorant is to... Um, implant upon them 
a sense of what's possible. You do this by keeping from them all the information, the scientific information, the esoteric information that shows that what is possible is vastly greater than what is perceived to be possible. But if you can get people to think, no, that's not possible, when people start um, talking about this is happening in the world and, and this is how they're doing it, people immediately go, that's ridiculous. That's not possible. Uh, what, what they're saying is they don't believe it's possible, not that it's not possible. And thus they dismiss uh, uh, explanations of the world uh, on the basis of what they've been programmed to believe is possible, which is ba basically what you can see, touch, uh, taste, and all the rest of it. And the area that uh, it might be good to, to talk about um, in relation to this box is, is something that, in, m in my view, this is fundamental to why that is. Of course, uh, you know, if you, you, I'm sure you've talked many times on this program about, indeed, there's a, there's a History Channel series uh, now, um, um, Aliens, the series, or uh, Ancient Aliens, the series. Right, yeah. Um, one, one of those programs uh, was entirely about this phenomena that I've been writing about for, for so long, of this common theme around the world in almost any culture of how some non-human race or non-human group um, manipulated human genetics. And I am absolutely convinced that this is what happened. How, hey, just to uh, follow on that, Deb, I want to let you give you time to explain that, but yeah, do you believe that this is a... Uh, that the earth was was created if you will then or, or potentially even the human race to be their farm and much in the same way that we have uh, you know cows or, or sheep or what have you or did the uh, the the reptilian slash gnostic uh, you know the archons or what have you come along later on and actually transform it into this what do you what do you believe about that well th this this is this is my view um enric um in terms of the the theme of the story i, I would say that um at some distant point in, in how we perceive time, of course, which is another illusion, um, human society was very much along the lines in many ways of that which was portrayed by the Avatar movie. You had um, the blue people on the moon, the Pandora moon, and they were aware that everything was connected they communicated with the natural world they communicated with the animals and they um were at a a much uh, more expanded level of consciousness and their range of frequency that they could decode into uh holographic reality if you like was much, much wider than this almost pathetic, tiny frequency range that we can now decode into any kind of uh, physical reality as we perceive it, mm. known as visible light, which is so tiny, it's almost laughable. Um, and then in the Avatar movies, along came um, these... Uh, in, the, in the film, they were um, uh, uh, American... Uh, military people from the sometime in the into the future with their high technology or what passed for it and this was a completely different mentality they came in with their uh, technology they had no perception of the connectedness of anything they were all left brain everything apart from everything else their values were not this beautiful interconnected uh, world but a there's there's resources under this blue people's buddy society um, that are worth a fortune so let's go in and get them and smash it all up and take the resources mm. if you take that mentality portrayed in the Avatar movie to be uh, uh, you know the reptilians coming in I would say that that's very very symbolic of it and also interestingly in the Avatar movie by its very uh, nature and name there was the concept of the American military, i.e., I would say the reptilians and, and uh, other non-human uh, groups, that infiltrated the blue people's society by taking on an outer shell of the blue people yeah, yeah. 
so that they could infiltrate that society without the blue people having any idea they were being infiltrated. Now, all those themes, Henrik, I think are absolutely what happened um, to, to, to Earth. There was an infiltration, there was a hijack, fantastic geological events which, which basically um, wiped clean the, uh, and deleted the previous society was all part of this. Um, and I, I have to say, I, I, someone sent me a, an interview you did with somebody uh, called Troy something, I think Troy, Troy, um, right. who, was, who, who, was, who was mentioned in his, uh, in his interview that, um, that I uh, was caught in the idea that this solar system has always been uh, as it is now. I mean, m my jaw dropped. I mean, uh, that's ludicrous. I mean, I have been uh, writing about the Velikovsky view of, of, of great cataclysmic events which moved all the planets, etc. about almost from the start right back into the 90s. And, and right. I think that happened um, in concert with this, uh, with this hijack. And I, th I think the original one was much further back than, than some people believe. But any, that doesn't matter. The fact that it happens is the point. Right. And then the genetic manipulation. Now they've got a blank sheet of paper or in effect. And um, the genetic manipulation started. And this is what I'm suggesting happened. You know, depending on the scientists you talk to, they, they say that something between 90 and 98 percent of uh, human DNA is what they call junk DNA or non-coding DNA. And the word junk came because they, they didn't know what it does. Uh, and, and most of it, they still don't know what it does. Um, and the idea that between 90 and 98 percent of human DNA has no function is ludicrous. I'm, I'm suggesting that actually what is within non-coding DNA, which they're now using as a, as a term much more because it's becoming even ludicrous to them that um, right. uh, it doesn't have any function. And of course, open-minded, cutting-edge scientists around the world, particularly some in Russia, um, have concluded that uh, non-coding DNA has its own language, as they put it, and it's different to the DNA that we think we know about. And I'm saying, actually, that within junk DNA, you have the inserted biological equivalent of software programs which are driving human behavior and human perceptions. And from that, uh, that software um, inserted, implanted within uh, non-coding DNA, come human personalities as we perceive them. Um, I found it interesting mm -hmm. that People like Carl Jung and, and other psychologists and psychiatrists over the years have claimed that they could break down human personalities into 12 major, more, more than that, yes, but 12 major archetypes and combinations of them. Now, when you're dealing with all possibility, the great forever that we really are beyond this illusory nonsense, then it, that's obviously the idea that you can break down human personalities into, into a group of archetypes and combinations. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But what can you, what can you break down into a, a few archetypes and combinations? Software programs, personalities, uh, uh, traits, emotional traits and responses and reactions, which are actually running within the human genetic structure. Now, I also found it interesting that I read so many accounts, uh, Henrik, of near-death experiences uh, that people have had, which included words to the effect of, when I was outside the body, I didn't feel emotion like I did within the body. Mm -hmm. I didn't have right. human emotion. It doesn't mean they were, they were uh, kind of cold or anything like that, but the, the human emotion they did not have of the type it, that we experience It's tied to the, the body. It's tied to the genetics, those emotions. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'm saying, um, that these emotional programs were implanted during this genetic manipulation of the human form, which, which went on and is recorded by all these ancient cultures. And so, um, if we are only perceiving reality from what I call body-mind, which is the holographic form and the, uh, and the energetic fields that interact with it, body-mind, 
and not opening that and allowing the greater self in consciousness as i call it which is operating and perceiving and observing from beyond this uh realm of our experience currently then i suggest that it is very possible and, and i think it's a, it, it's it's very common shall i say that people can go through an entire human lifetime without having a single original thought or emotional response <laughs> that has not come from um, within this software or externally manipulated sources. And therefore, when you're in that state, you become incredibly predictable. And um, when you, it's like, you know, if you type information into a computer, you know what that computer's going to do when you press enter because it's programmed to do that. Yep. And in the same way, um, as you type um, information into a computer, that's symbolic in the human experience of the various situations we find ourselves in. And, and when you go around the world, of course there are exceptions, but generally, if people of different cultures um, face the same situation, it's almost like pressing enter. You pretty much know how they're going to respond. Um, and, and you take it to this, this, other, um, this other aspect. I was speaking earlier about the fact that um, these entities feed off human low vibrational emotional energy mm. well by putting the emotional program within the body mind biological computer as i see it all you then have to do henrik is to um create a society which by its nature is constantly triggering the emotional responses within the software mm, yeah. and what's that doing it's turned humans into um, producers of the very energy that these entities use as a power source. So when in the Matrix movie you had the Morpheus character holding up the, um, the battery and saying, basically summarizing, um, that humans have been turned into one of these, that is a, a profound truth in my view. Mm. And so... If we are going to get out of this um, enslavement, and this is why the control system is terrified of this, we need to open our minds to allow consciousness in. And when we and, and to do that, we've got to put aside all these preconceived beliefs, preconceived ideas which acts like energetic firewalls and sensors to stop um, uh, us being influenced by the greater self. And we become isolated in terms of our point of attention into basically five sense reality. And when we are uh, enslaved inside five sense reality, we are in the very stadium which this, these entities have created and thus um, are experts at and and so when someone opens their minds to consciousness uh, uh, they then begin to perceive the world differently because their point of attention has now been dramatically expanded yet yes they still have a point of attention in the five senses because that's how we interact with this reality but it's expanded out into consciousness and thus you see the world in a much more expanded way um, you can see things you couldn't see before. You can see how the dots connect, because all you could see was individual dots before that seemed to have no connection. And suddenly it's like, whoa, I never saw this before. And what happens then is those that are still uh, uh, being played by the program, they listen to these people and look at these people, and all they can, uh, all they can respond with is, you're crazy. Mm. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Possible. You want a psychiatrist, mate, because they literally can't um, perceive what you're perceiving. There's that great line, I think it's from uh, the writer John Milton, who said uh, words to the effect of, um, you know, y y the dancer and the dance. You, 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 the, you cannot 
uh, understand the dancer if you can't hear the music that the dancer is dancing to. You just yeah. think they're crazy, dancing for no reason. And so um, you see this awakening, Henrik, that's going on now as people are teasing, teasing out of this program uh, version of self in the world and they're starting to move that point of observation and we call it an awakening what is actually it is is breaking the bubble that most people live in which which keeps a consciousness out and it's about time too i mean if, if i see it i've mentioned this many times before but i see it kind of falling two ways because you seem to have one group of humans as well that are kind of falling deeper into the illusion deeper into exactly. the bubble it's almost like a a computer game as well you have a handful of these characters that you can choose between in a sense and and the 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 able uh, their ability rather to actually being able to predict the future to to come up with a you know to run a supercomputer on a program basically that has a a preset uh, you know program that is about detecting future behavior you need to have a population that is very very limited in these responses that you talk about as well so it's about control at at, at the bottom of this as well and also to kind of create a limit the bandwidth of the consciousness itself and create a, a kind of a small minded people in a sense because the once you get them inside of that box it's they're very very easy to be you know to to track their behavior and predictable in a sense as well so i feel that yep. the control aspect is essential uh, in, in this case and that's why as you said david they hate people who actually break out of the mold because we have this illusion of individuality what color do you want on your iphone that that's how it's extended now and uniqueness yeah, and individuality is almost out the door unfortunately it's like i saw a I saw on a car sticker in California once, uh, you laugh at me because I'm different, I laugh at you because you're all the same. Uh, this yeah, is the, 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 the <laughs> dynamic of, of it. But it, it, what you say there about um, squeezing the frequency, I, I, I'm absolutely with. I've been writing about that for years because uh, one of the, the big breakthroughs is when you start to understand that DNA is a receiver transmitter. And, of course, a receiver transmitter operates on what? It operates on a frequency range. And, you know, these, these stories about uh, in the ancient, ancient, ancient world, the gods lived among them. Well, right. I think the gods did live among them because their frequency range of humans to decode reality into a what we would call uh, a, a physical reality um, was much wider. And, therefore, we could see these, quote, gods because they were within the f much more expanded frequency range that we could access and perceive. This genetic manipulation, I strongly suggest, a major part of it was to squeeze the frequency range that, that you, the human body computer, as I call it, body-mind, uh, DNA re uh, receiver transmitter, was receiving and transmitting on. And thus, the gods are still where they always were, but we can't see them anymore because we are no longer um, going that far out in the frequency band where we can actually uh, see them. And so um, they have um, hidden themselves from human sight by genetic manipulation and then created these hybrid bloodlines, the Illuminati bloodlines, within this tiny frequency range of, of, uh, of human perception um, to... to, to um, be the the conduits for their agenda while humans have not a clue um that it's actually uh going on and to to understand what's happening you have to get out of body mind there is a limit to how much names dates places research i do all that i've done it for 20 years it needs doing mm. but there is a limit to how far down the rabbit hole that is going to take you um, and it's my view, uh, for what it's worth, that if you're an expert on 9-11, an expert on banking scams, political scams, engineered wars, and um, um, engineered terrorist events, all of which needs researching and exposing, but if that's, you're an expert on that, and that alone, you're still walking around the outer rim of the rabbit hole. From my perspective, yeah. you've not yeah. even entered it yet. Yeah. Um, 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 and, and what we have, of course, is religious belief, political belief, cultural belief, all acting as suppressors um, of open-minded, go-where-the-music-takes-you research, um, and, and also realizing that a lot of stuff has got to come through your own intuitive knowing, 
and by reading the language of life and the signs and the clues that we're given because there comes a point where if you if you want names dates places proof for everything i's dotted t's crossed well okay you'll go that far but you won't go any further because there comes a point where that that information is not available we have to go th uh, th through other ways of perceiving and bringing this awareness into some kind of of um of, of storyline if you like to yeah. explain what's going on that's right we're going to take a break in a minute or so david but before that i just want to comment a bit on what you said earlier because there's actually some some science behind this idea as well that that belief obviously and you know this uh, you know affects reality but we also have the idea that even science the written word the alphabet in itself even the law that's connected with that written law versus oral law actually are changing uh, your consciousness dramatically it it locks us into the left brain portion of the world and there's even studies done on on how human civilization has been going up and down this is from the work of, of people like leonard schlein for instance and and shows actually how the adaptation of the written word uh how, how that has transformed society as far as we if we if we look at the uh the revival of images and the renaissance things like that uh, versus the the alphabetical written side of things and and so there is science behind this idea that that we t we t we're totally locked down in in what's on the paper kind of thing and this also constructs our perception of reality meaning that's another factor why i think people are not prone to be in a in a mystical consciousness these days david they, they don't see the things that that mankind allegedly did you know many many thousands of years ago where they have more interaction with the environment almost more of the avatar type uh, you know society that you mentioned before david yeah well what, what if we come into up to a break pretty shortly henrik um I, i'll wait till afterwards but i was having a conversation uh, only about 20 minutes before the interview started with someone about this very thing and the relationship of uh, of of word communication as opposed to other kinds of communication and uh, is something i'd like to talk about when the, when we've had the break absolutely let's uh, do that then and come right back i'm going to of course mention in the meantime here that the book is called remember who you are it's a new excellent book that you can pick up either at davidike.com that's the main website obviously or at davidikebooks.com as well and uh, if there is someone who want to know more by the way about robert green uh, there is a website currently set up for that you have it linked up on your site as well it's free robert green uh, co uk where you can find out more about that and how to get involved and potentially help along into getting robert out there uh, anything else you want to mention about books or website david please go ahead well, no, that's that that that's fine. Um, uh, the the other thing that, that I'm doing this year is um, the the biggest event I've ever done uh, at Wembley Arena in London, um, because um, that can be anything between five thousand and ten thousand people, depends on how many want to come. Um, it's a decision we have to make um, uh, in uh, the very end of uh, of July um, on on what numbers we're going to cater for. But uh, the reason I'm doing it is because, um, well, first of all we kind of outgrown in terms of interest the London venues we did before and the middle venues like the Albert Hall didn't want to know <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and and so uh, I decided to go for it and go for this 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 major venue because I wanted to make a statement um, that could not be ignored um, which is have a look at the number of people who are here did some things changing some things happening look at it and um also i i think you know if we can gather enough people together of like mind in one place and those sort of numbers then the impact on the what um some people call the morphic field the the information field of the earth will be fantastic especially in a um, an energetically very important um area uh, of of england and london i mean the you know the conspiracy is not so uh, so much based in London and England for no reason. It's yeah. all about energy and it's all about controlling the energy grid. And um, you know there are many levels to this Wembley event. So that's that's the thing that I'm really working for this year. Excellent. Uh, just go to davidike.com and just scroll down and you see the banner or the poster right there. Uh, David Ike, remember who you are. It's at the Wembley Arena in London there, October 27th, 2012. And you can book your tickets right there as well. That's excellent. Did you ever think you'd end up on the stage in in Wembley, David? By the way, <laughs> uh, no, I, I I never thought I'd end up uh, on any stage at one point worth the name stage because no one wanted to know. But it's fantastic that if you 
you know, I have this, this phrase, you can't unhear something. So keep speaking your truth. And if people laugh at you, well, fine. Uh, and if people dismiss you, well, fine. But if your truth has any validity, it will eventually be shown to be so. And when it is, people won't be able to forget where they first heard it. And thus, um, you uh, can make reality change by continuing to speak your truth and to walk your truth rather than